Hello, and welcome to The Simpsons Countdown, the podcast where we go back to the beginning and watch all of The Simpsons to trace its creative evolution and count down, finding the exact moment in which the show began to basically suck. I'm your host, Eric Antoine. This week, I'm once again joined by Joshua Fine, and we are discussing the episode Moaning Lisa, which originally aired on February 11th, 1990, and introduced the character of Bleeding Gums Murphy to Springfield and the world. Up front, I will say it is not one of our favorite episodes, and maybe that's why we are prone to go off on tangents discussing video games and whatnot. But we do also discuss music in relation to The Simpsons, and that dreadful novelty album, The Simpsons Sing the Blues. As is to be expected with these discussions by now, we go all over the place. But the important thing is we have a little fun and reminisce. So please join us, whether you're commuting or exercising or defecating. I hope you enjoy what follows. Here we go. So how you doing, Josh? Welcome back. Well, I'm doing very good. Hopefully for the uh, listeners out there, I will sound a lot better. I spent a cool $65 on this audio rig. So I'd like to think that the money spent will be reflected in the higher quality sound and listenability of my voice. I can already tell that this is going to sound a lot better. So yeah. I, I think we're I think we're good. Great. How, how, how's the weather over there? How, how are things going over there by you? Weather is fine. It's actually expected to rain finally this week. That'll be nice. Get that nice Blade Runner vibe. Of course, driving through it is an unyielding hell, but it is great and uh, moody to walk in. That's pretty good. Uh, weather here is nice, too. Uh, we haven't had too much rain. Rainy season seems to be just about over, so mm. we have that nice dry La Paz heat. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice and sunny out, and it's a nice day. So uh, today we're talking about Moaning Lisa, notable for being the the introduction of Bleeding Gums Murphy, but also sort of the introduction of Lisa, her musical ability. You know, it's not, you see it in the opening sequence, you see her playing her saxophone in the opening sequence, but this is the first episode where that really gets delved into, I believe. And also her being real moody and her intellectual ability, all that gets laid down in this episode. And I remember from our conversation last, you talked about the influence of James L. Brooks. And I uh, went and looked at the history of this episode. This was actually an episode that Brooks had suggested. And then uh, Al Jean and Mike Reese went ahead and wrote. So you're more familiar with the works of James L. Brooks than I am. And uh, I think that that melodrama, the overall moodiness that Lisa's feeling is definitely a staple of Brooks, I imagine. Right. The storyline is based around Lisa not wanting to play dodgeball, I believe it is, not wanting to participate in gym class because she is too sad, right? That's right. She's too sad. She just wakes up with that existential uh, angst and ennui that uh, Judd Apatow has built an entire career out of and usually takes five hours for what this one episode does in 22 minutes. But yeah, so she's, she's sad. She wakes up. And I noticed there's a bottle of glum toothpaste sitting on the uh, bathroom uh, sink. So I don't know if that was an early attempt at signage and visual humor by The Simpsons. And uh, she's in such a, um, a rut that, yeah, it just it impacts her day. And, you know, you just get to that, as I said, that existential angst of like, what am I doing? What is the point of this? Uh, some could say it's a depression. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not a medical professional, so I'm not going to go that far. But it, it weighs on her heavily. And, you know, just that introspective moodiness as well. Right. I think it's a pretty accurate portrayal of, let's say, let's call it depression. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it doesn't really get defined that way, but people's well-meaning but kind of shallow ways of dealing with it. You know, when you have a friend who is going through depression or whatever, sometimes we tend to be very, at, at times we can be very just say like platitudes, you know what I mean? Right. Or, you know, you, you're trying to cheer the person up. So he goes, oh, you know, well, so here you have that whole thing with like Marge telling her to just smile or whatever it is. Like that that whole sequence is kind of interesting, I, I think. I, it lends into her backstory. You see how it was when she was a kid. You know, her, her, her mother told her to do that. And then 
she goes and she does that and then mm -hmm. so she wants to impart that advice to Lisa and then you have that whole thing where they go to school and she actually sees it in practice and realizes how ridiculous it is and just tells her to be herself. I, I would say that's you know the kind of one of the common you know tropes of you know when you just got to be yourself and it'll be okay but I, I agree with you about the about how it lends some artists back to her. I think it's a generational thing as well. You know, women of that time and you know even you see that the issues that this episode was dealing with that they briefly touch on still to this day it happens and it's just under a much heavier level of uh, magnification screw i want you to smile today but i don't feel like smiling well it doesn't matter how you feel inside you know it's what shows up on the surface that counts that's what my mother taught me Take all your bad feelings and push them down, all the way down, past your knees until you're almost walking on them. And then you'll fit in and you'll be invited to parties and boys will like you. Going back to, to your initial point about uh, James L. Brooks and the melodrama, the melodrama is not right the word. I, I like to use the word dramedy, dramedy. You know, like, like that's sort of, if you look at James L. Brooks's film work, you know, you look at like Terms of Endearment, Broadcast News, as good as it gets. These films are comedies or they're comedic, but at the same time, they're full of drama. So yeah, going to the James L. Brooks of it all. Yes, this is this is a very James L. Brooks episode. There is some humor, but it is mostly a dramedy type episode. Would you agree? It's it's I not I would agree with that. I think there's little touches of humor, you know, and uh, I, I think that also goes to what the subplot is of uh, Homer and Bart, you know, playing a video game together. The only other bit of humor I noticed was uh, when Lisa's talking to Bleeding Gums Murphy, and I, I missed this originally, and then I picked it up on the second time around where he, he says to her, You know, you play pretty well for someone with no real problems. This is ultimately a comedy show, so of course there's humor. The subplot of Homer and Bart playing that boxing game, that was the part that stayed with me when I first watched this show. You know, when, when it first aired and I first watched it, I do remember this was not one of my favorite episodes, but I did enjoy that subplot, the whole thing with, with Homer and Bart playing the boxing game and Homer desperately trying to get better at it. Like that, that's a kind of a running thing throughout the episode. I think it's very well handled. And th that's what provides, I think, the biggest laughs of the episode. To me, it's the most, you know, typical sitcom type plot. I will point out that this was an episode in early uh, 1990. And when I was rewatching it, I was thinking this is probably one of the rare, uh, few instances where you see an adult play a video game, uh, especially with a kid. I don't recall ever seeing that before because uh, video games were definitely, you know, viewed as to be like, you know, little kid toys or stuff for like teenagers. But to see a parent play with a child with a video game, I don't remember ever seeing that with sitcoms around that time. I think the other time I could think of where video games, where adults were playing video games was probably in uh, Never Say Never Again, and that was uh, uh, something for the rich. The subplot also has an almost Tales from the Crypt-like dream where Homer has a nightmare and that he's in the video game and he's being killed by his own kid. What up, your dudes, Homer? Bart, go easy on me. I'm your dad. I am going easy on you, but you're just so old and slow and weak and pathetic. No! 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 Speaking of adults playing video, I mean, you're talking about Never Say Never Again, which is from 83. And that same year, we had Superman 3, in which Robert Vaughn is basically playing a Superman video game. I don't know if you recall that. In Superman 3, you have, you know, uh, Robert Vaughn trying to kill Superman with missiles. It's this very elaborate video game with really good graphics. I believe that it was going to be a Superman 3 arcade game that never came to fruition, but the graphics that you see on screen were going to be the game. Something about 1983, interesting that both of those movies, Never Stay Never Again and Superman 3, came out in 83. He's still coming! He's going to get me! Don't bet on it! 83s were the, uh, the it was the, the infamous video game crash. That was like the first wave of video games with Atari and some of the other, I think actually may have been just basically Atari. And then they got, you know, they, they too much, there was too much garbage product and they overextended themselves and the whole market crashed. And then it, 
And then it took two years for Nintendo to hit the U.S. market. It was right then. Video games were kind of a thing. They were becoming a mainstream thing. That's so why they were featured in all these movies. And then barely a year after that, it was over. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's kind of like, and people thought, oh, this is a fad. This is done. Video games are done. Oh, yeah. Um, it's amazing that people actually, people actually believe that in 84, they said, video games are done. They're over. They're over. They're done. Only from Atari. Made especially for systems from Atari. The video game that lets you help E.T. get home. Just in time for Christmas. Right, going back to uh, to The Simpsons, the, the whole sure. thing with the video game, uh, playing the boxing video game, one thing that is, I, I love the way that The Simpsons depicts video games. You know, there are parodies of existing games a lot of the time. One thing, though, that I find amusing is that whatever video game system this is that, uh, that Bart is using has some pretty good graphics i mean that, that that's yeah. uh that you look at that boxing game if sega genesis was had just come out the 16-bit uh, revolution was just beginning you know you had turbo graphics 16 right. you had sega genesis that, that had just come out in the holiday season of 89 you know so it was not in a household thing yet it wasn't that everybody had one i certainly didn't have one Yes. Oh, I didn't have one either. I, I could tell you. And I, I would also add that that video game that we see in The Simpsons is probably one of the most violent video games in existence, especially for that period of time. I don't think there was anything that bloody or with that level of dismemberment, except maybe, well, no, Slaughterhouse, uh, no, Splatterhouse. That was it. Splatterhouse for the TurboGrafx-16, I think it was 91. I'm sure someone is probably yelling into their uh, into the air correcting me, but... Yeah, I didn't have a TurboGrafx-16. I did have a Nintendo, especially around that time. And then I eventually had a SNES, Super Nintendo, and when that came out, and then a Genesis a little bit after that. So at one point, I had three video game systems, and I would just rent games all the time. My folks thought it was a—and they were kind of right. You know, let the, uh, let the boy try a game out versus us spending 50 to $60 on a game he may not like. And just and just see what happens. And I still remember my the very first video game I ever rented, and that was uh, from Blockbuster, and that was Legend of Zelda. And I did not get very far because I didn't understand really how the game worked. But I, I still remember that. I think probably I was even working off of someone's file because it was one of those games that you could save on. But yeah, this uh, boxing game, extremely advanced detail graphics and extremely violent. In fact, that probably would be a rated M for mature if it had been released today. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there were no games that had graphics that were this good at that time for the home market, even on like Genesis or something. Nothing looked this good in ter in, in relative terms, number one. Number two, nothing was quite this violent. You you mentioned some, some violent uh, games like, uh, of course, the very famous one, the one that kind of broke the mold about the whole thing was Mortal Kombat, which, you know, came a couple of years after this. But in, let's say, 1990... Maybe like the, the one video game that had a little bit of controversy around it, I believe it was already out for the Genesis because it's one of the first games, is this game called Technocop. I don't know mm. if uh, if you're familiar with that game. No, I've never heard of it. Technocop is a, I guess it's a post-apocalyptic as these things uh, tend to be. And it's basically you're a, I guess you're a cop, but you know, you're, you're dressed in civvies and you, you drive through like a post-apocalyptic wasteland you know, you're driving through this road, you have a car that's got like a cannon mounted on the on the hood of it and whatever. And you're, you know, you're driving, you drive from place to place and you're supposed to grab criminals. And on your way to a specific location, it tells you what criminal it is that you're searching for. And it's going to tell you if he's wanted dead or alive. And you always arrive at like a tenement building, like, like a, a shitty building. It's always the same. And then, and as you walk through there, you know, you, you meet various punks or whatever, you kill them. It has that like 80s, that late 80s vibe where like the bad guys have mohawks or like you, you'll, you'll see some guy show up with like a, a Jason mask. They do that kind of thing. And anyway, so when you shoot them, when you shoot the bad guys, they explode into like a, a puddle of pulp, you know, for the time that was, I remember like my friend had, like, I didn't have a Genesis yet, but a friend of mine did. And, and he had that game. And when I, when I saw that game, I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I was like, Oh, that's awesome. Like you shoot them and they blow up. They like, they like explode into like a bloody mess and it's awesome. And so I like, I was obsessed with that game. And so I guess maybe, okay. So you had some violent games and maybe they were anticipating that, a little bit when they're making fun in The Simpsons with this boxing game of making it very heightened, very violent. Technocop. 
Contacte. I do like how he resol- Homer resolves it, is that he just gets, it's like, all right, I'll just go to the arcade and uh, I'll just get the best kid to show me how to pl- learn and play this game. So he doesn't even try to cheat. He actually does try to learn how to learn and understand the game. And he effectively defeats Bart. I, that was surprisingly a smart move by Homer, just going out and just find, you know, learning how to play it. Yeah, again, it's the idea of this adult going to, you know, playing video games. It's not something you normally see. Uh, give me some quarters. I'm doing my laundry. Yeah, right. Where's the video boxing? It's over there in the corner. But if I were you, I really would use those quarters for laundry. Why, it's guy? It is kind of strange that. They make a thing out of an adult playing video games, right? It shows yeah. you how generations change and how like things were back then, back in you know 1990, let's say. Mm-hmm. It would seem it would seem odd. It was a kind of thing where they make a big deal out of, oh, this is really for kids. Video games are supposed to be for kids, but now think about it. I mean, one of the biggest things in New York, a big thing, is barcade. You know? Oh, yeah. And and that's because those kids, uh, you know, 30 years ago are now adults. So they grew up with it. So, yeah, you have barcades, obviously video games and consoles have gotten so advanced. It's why you don't really see arcades anymore. And if there are arcades, they are throwback. It does remind you that these games are designed to eat money. So when you are playing yeah, on that's... limited continues, you realize how short they are. Well, that is true. Like now with the whole MAME thing where you can actually emulate, you can have... You know the MAME emulator mm-hmm. on your uh, on computer. You know you can you can download arcade game ROMs where you can basically have unlimited quarters if you want and just right. play through some of these games, which are you see them you see how they're designed. You go like, yeah, this was designed to eat quarters. Basically, the thing's like five levels long. It's done, and it's usually very anticlimactic when you finally get to the end. Oh yeah, a g- quick example of that is when I got to play a uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the arcade game. Uh, when I used to have an Xbox 360, for a time you could download that. The same thing with the Simpsons arcade game. And you could clear both of those in about 25, 30 minutes. Yeah, no, or, or sometimes less, depends on how, how good you are. Speaking yeah. of, let, let, since we're talking about video games and since we're talking about The Simpsons, let's let's take a minute to discuss mm-hmm. The Simpsons arcade game. Okay, so The Simpsons arcade game came out in 1991, about a year, about a year after this. And you look at that game and it's so just goes to show how things it's done by konami so it, it was done in that style of the brawlers you know yes. for four players konami kind of pioneered this first they had crime fighters then they had as you mentioned the teenage mutant ninja turtles game which was also for four players and then they came out with the simpsons again a four player brawler essentially very nice graphics you pick one of the you know, family members, except Maggie, and you walk around Springfield beating up people. It, it has this, like, odd storyline. I believe Maggie gets kidnapped. Yeah, that's right. Is There's that, a, is that... That, yeah, I, I remember, I'll never forget the intro, as I, I remember it vividly in many a Pizza Hut arcade, but there's a jewelry store robbery, and I think it's, it may have been Smithers, actually, because what ends up happening is that there's a diamond that gets loose, and then Maggie gets a hold of the diamond because it lands in her mouth like it's a pacifier, and Smithers... Uh, kidnaps Maggie and runs off. So where it ends up, the final boss is Mr. Burns at the uh, power plant. But in the interim, you are you know starting off just fighting wave after wave of you know random you know, guys wearing neckties in the first level, and you know the second level was Krusty Land. I mean, it's it had the story doesn't make any sense, but it, it is a a fun um, brawler as you said. I mean, I'll never forget one of the biggest urban legends was, and this was in the first level, was that there was a cop car that just sat on the street. And I remember uh, this is one of the things you learned about on the playground that that you could pick up that cop car and throw it, but you have to have multiple people. And I was like, ah, oh, that can't happen. That's that's an urban legend. That that's a lie. And then decades later, I watched some video of some clip of that game of that level. And yes, you can throw that cop bar. It just, again, you have to have multiple people to do it. You know what? That's news to me. I didn't even know you could do that. But I guess you need all four players, right? It, it can't, you know, obviously you can't do it I by think yourself. So, yeah. You need, like... yeah, I can't. I You can't do it on your own because I know if you try to lift it, you just struggle and then you right. can't pick it up. And I'll never forget that it gets Marge with the vacuum cleaner, Bart with the skateboard, Lisa with the jump rope. And then Homer had his fists. I mean, basically, you know, 
as you said, the Ninja Turtles game was the was Konami. So basically, Konami took the Ninja Turtles engine or whatever the, the hell they used and just put the Simpsons skins over it. And I mean, it's basically the same type of game. Oh, it's, uh, yes, absolutely. It's basically that. As you say, it's a fun game. It's got, you know, nice graphics, nice colorful graphics, representing the world of Springfield in a fairly accurate way. And the story doesn't make any sense. But I remember it wasn't until I wasn't able, you know, I, I would play it frequently at the arcades and uh, with friends, but I was never able to beat it until much later when either, I'm going to say it was before it came out, like for home systems, when it was available for download at the, what is it, Xbox Live or yes. even on, for the PS3, I believe it was also available at once upon a time. But even before that, using a MAME emulator, I was finally able to, you know, play it and play through it with my friend. And it was funny how, like, they used some some cool voice samples from the show. You know, they you you have actual samples of their voices, you know, Homer, Marge. But then when you get to the end, yes, uh, Mr. Burns is the final boss, who I believe he comes down in some, like, giant, you know, hot air balloon or something like that. Kind of robot-like of... thing. And it has, like, three different forms. And then, but the level before that is the TV station. And your boss is some type of samurai-like warrior. Uh, yes. Which has nothing to do with anything. Yeah, that it makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't, it's not even something from the show. And that, that those, those are the two things that I remember about that game. Like, throughout, so one thing was that throughout the game, there's one enemy character who's like a guy in a suit. Yes. And because of the way he looks, he's wearing like a blue suit. He's got kind of brown hair, kind of combed in a kind of a pompadour. But with right. my friend, we used to think that that character, that sprite, resembled actor Michael Keaton. So we would just refer to him as Michael Keaton. Like whenever <laughs> he would show up, we was like, oh, got to beat up on Michael Keaton. And then <laughs> when you get to the end, then you have, you know, Mr. Burns and Smithers or whatever. I guess they couldn't get this, the voice samples or maybe there weren't enough samples or maybe I mean, who knows what happened because you have Homer, you have Lisa, uh, Marge and Bart. Like that's, you know, they have little voice samples from the show. But Mr. Burns, I don't know what that is. That's, that's not the voice of Mr. Burns. It doesn't sound anything like him. So I, I don't know what happened there. Or maybe Harry Shearer was just like, no, I'm not going to allow you to use my voice or something. Who knows? I, who knows? I, it yeah. probably is a scheduling thing, or maybe you know what it could be is it's, they didn't have enough room for all the voices because they've certainly with games later on they have all the character voices and uh, certainly I mean if you know Fox was they just didn't care they could just take the voices that they already have and just put it in there and that's actually kind of what happened with Robin Williams with the Aladdin game the Aladdin games I think for uh, Genesis Super Nintendo and that actually got and and all and the toys is that they just used his voice work the existing voice work and just put it in. And that caused a, a lot of grief, a lot of uh, money as well for Disney. Well, yeah, I believe because he, I think that, and I, and Robin Williams was upset about this or something. Mean, I, I know that there was some kind of a rift between mm -hmm. Disney and Robin Williams right around, you know, after Aladdin, post Aladdin. I think it had something to do with that where they used his voice or they used this or that and he wasn't getting enough residuals or something. Yeah, he wasn't getting enough residuals, and I, he hadn't initially agreed to it, and uh, he got really offended by that. And I think to the point that that's why he wasn't in the second Aladdin movie. He refused to do it because for those reasons. And then he came back, or I think Jeffrey Katzenberg, or uh, no, actually it may have been Michael Eisner, one of the two, gave him like an eight-figure advance as a way of as a gesture of goodwill. Right, and, that, and actually, interesting, interesting factoid. So. Robin Williams did not come back to voice the genie in the sequel in The Return of Jafar, right. but you know who you know who did the voice? Dan Castellaneta. He's big. He's blue. He's black. Genie. So anyway, back to the episode. So the yes. big thing about this episode is that it it introduces Bleeding Gums Murphy, who you know was a character who was around for a while until they kind of phased him out for whatever reason. I, but, I, I think uh, in, he was really in like two episodes, which was this one and then the episode where he comes back where he's dying. And then um, they had like an in memoriam. He's voiced by Ron Taylor, who is a, uh, a character actor. I know him specifically in three different things. One, he's in trading places as the guy in the jail cell that goes, yeah. And for everything that he says is just, yeah. He's also in a very memorable episode of Quantum Leap. Uh, where Sam leaps into the body of a uh, African-American med student, I think, during the 1965 Watts riots. 
And then lastly, to no fault of Ron Taylor's fault of his own, Ron Taylor is, is a character in Twin Peaks and what I consider to be the second worst subplot next to, uh, I think it's Ben Horn's latent neo-Confederacy fetish. But uh, Ron Taylor shows up as, I think, a football coach who just sees uh, Nadine, who is now going back to high school after she gets amnesia. And Ron Taylor is amazed by Nadine's amazing strength. But that subplot in uh, Twin Peaks is one of the worst. But again, no fault to his own. No, I mean, he, he, he does the best he could with uh, with terrible material. I think it, it's it's worth noting that you're talking about that's the, the period of Twin Peaks where I think there's about – it's like a six-episode stretch in the second mm-hmm. season where it is unwatchable. Like it is painfully unwatchable. It, it is off the rails. Unwatchable. Absolutely off the rails. James is still cool. He's always been cool. The one I think it's worth noting, Ron Taylor, one of his claims to fame is that he actually originated the role of Audrey II in the in the 1982 Off Broadway, in the original Off Broadway Little Shop of Horrors, in the original Off Broadway cast. He was the originator of the role of Audrey II, and so that's you know he ha- he does have a, a good singing voice. He's got that you know that baritone cool voice that is required. You know, when rewatching this episode, I always thought that Bleeding Gums Murphy had a much more pr- prominent role in the episode. And not at all. He's really only in, in two scenes. And I, I'd always had it in my head that Lisa and Bleeding Gums had much more of an involved friendship. But you, that really comes up in the episode where he comes back and uh, he's in the hospital. And I just had conflated the two. So are, are you saying that they – did they kill off the character because Ron Taylor himself passed away? I, I don't think they killed him off. I think he, it was just it was just a matter of, yeah, he had passed away. And so I don't think they were going to reuse that character, I think. But it's, it's just one of those instances, as we saw with Dr. Marvin Monroe. You have one of these very early characters that you think is going to be much more prominent as the show goes on. And in, in an early, like, merchandise and – a distinct character, but yeah, it just falls by the wayside, and you're gonna, and we're gonna see that as we go throughout the show. Of like, certainly cat people that they tried to make into something, or you see like early versions of other characters that don't go anywhere. Like we see this female gym teacher that we never see again. Like one of the, you know, the, some of the kids that we see, you know, the the kid that Homer meets. I think Howard is is the kid's name. We never see that kid again. The video game champion, you mean? The video game champion, the 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 kid with Tude. As I wrote down in my notes, and I think even there was a kid that kind of had that kind of looked like Ralph Wiggum, but his hair was up and he sounded like Nelson at the end, you know, towards the end where uh, he's talking to Lisa. You get to see the evolution of how these characters are designed. But certainly, as you said, I think it's just because this was the death of Ron Taylor and he was, you know, he was the voice of that character. It just wouldn't make sense to try to reuse him. And I don't think they've ever really had any other person that was a jazz or blues type guy in the show. I can't think off off the top of my head, at least not as prominent or as distinct as uh, Bleeding Gums. And that's the thing. It's a whole blues thing. And in the previous uh in our previous episode, we did discuss how The Simpsons at this time was doing a lot of music, you know, was doing a, was had a tendency to do little musical pieces that were original. And in this case, you have a couple of really corny, cheesy kind of blues songs right. that they that they do for the episode. Mm-hmm. They're corny. I mean, they're they're very cheesy. And I remember shortly after this, The Simpsons again. You know, they had arcade games, they had toys, and they had. The Simpsons, they had an album, The Simpsons Sing the Blues. Do you, do you remember that? I do. I do remember that. I didn't own that album, but I remember playing it. I think a kid on my block had it. And I think even like you could play it uh, certain music stores that allowed you to play free samples of like of albums because that's how you would listen to music back then before you spent like $20, $25 on a CD. But yeah, that was one of the first things that stood out. Yeah, it was a prominent album. I think, yeah, that was the first one. I remember buying the second album, which was had more of their songs. Simpsons and the music always was, you could see that it was from the start. I will point out, as cheesy as those blues songs were, they were that was some good wailing sax. Very much of a lethal weapon <laughs> type caliber. I did own that album. I owned it because I was a fan, so I had to have it. And that, that was an album of original music. It wasn't a soundtrack album or anything. 
but if anyone wants to listen to them now, I don't even know if I don't even know if it's on Spotify or, or whatever. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I, I'm sure I that no, I have no doubt it's on YouTube. It's it's definitely uh, around. It's not good. It's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just let's not mince words. It is. You, not you tell good. me that Nancy Cartwright is not a natural singer. No, I mean it's the thing is that the songs themselves are grandly terrible. The 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 hit single was "Do the Bart Man." Yes, right? that that song was produced by Michael Jackson, I believe, or certainly by. I don't know if it was written or co-written. Definitely produced by him. If you can do the Bart, you're bad like Michael Jackson. It's dreadful. Oh, yeah. the, there's even a, a song including that features Burns and Smithers. And in that song, there, there's like a, a spoken part where Burns says something like, I said do it, so do it, do it, do it. Yes, sir. I think they were trying to make that like a catchphrase. It's in one of the episodes. It might be, I think it's in Homer's Odyssey where he's like, I said do it, now do it, do it, do it. But then it's not like something that, happened that frequently it didn't really it for whatever like that's not the catchphrase burns's yeah. catchphrase became excellent right yes. like, that, like that that became his catchphrase and i think it's a much better catchphrase than i said do it now do it do it do it is it any wonder i'm singing singing the blues yes the album is bad it, it they also it, it features a cover of i love to see you smile the Rand newman song that uh, is from the from the motion picture parenthood and it's actually full of covers. I mean, it's got like, uh, it's got uh, Born Under a Bad Sign. And that one features B.B. King on guitar and the horn section from Tower of Power. It it features the the extended version of the, the song from this episode, the Moaning Lisa blues or whatever. Mm -hmm. It actually features the complete song. Like a chick without a budget. Like a watch without a dial. These are not. This is not good music. But there was a. There was quite a lot of it. Um, they, as you said, the wailing sax part was. You know, it's on point. Here's the thing that that I like to do uh, from time to time, and some people might find it irritating, but I don't care. What do we think of the two things that happen in this episode? Like you, you have Lisa befriends this blues musician, who for whatever reason is playing under a bridge. She befriends him. So you, you have that, that part is kind of nice. But then Marge's reaction to this is at first negative. The, the episode doesn't give us an explanation for why she feels bad about it, other than she feels it's inappropriate for, you know, uh, her young daughter to be hanging out with this old blues guy under right. a bridge, right? Could someone look at that as racist? Not at all. I, I think, well, I think it, you know what, they even try to touch on that in the, ep in, in what she says, it's just, she's trying to explain, it's like, I just don't feel comfortable with my kid hanging out with strangers. I think that was what they may have been trying to infer. Yeah. Uh, certainly someone could make that reach, but I think it seems pretty clear that uh, this is a kid walking around the streets at night, just talking to a random stranger and interacting with a random stranger. You know, Marge doesn't know who Bleeding Gums is and, this is also in the era of stranger danger and, you know, kids wandering off and, and, you know, going missing. So, you know, she's a typical sitcom mom. She's going to worry about her kids. I mean, I'll say this. She's not screaming at him. She's not, no. you know, uh, you know, freaking out. She's just she's being, you know, her margeness of being uh, pleasant, you know, and being respectful and trying to make it clear. It's like I just don't feel comfortable with my kid hanging around with you. And you can see Bling Gums is pro totally fine with it. In fact, he probably, you know. He's probably uh, surprised that, you know, why would this kid hang around with me? It kind of reminds me of, and I'll, I'll be brief about this, is that, you know, when I was a kid, precocious, you know, or maybe my interests were like, you know, in, in specific things that only adults would know, I would hang around with like some adults and try to, you know, talk to them about it. I'll never forget, this was like 20 years ago, so I was like 17, 16, 17, I would hang out at this comic shop on Sundays, and there was a guy there, he was an older guy, and we would just, you know, talk about comics and stuff. But it, it reminded me of that, and I, that's how I kind of had it in my head before rewatching this in that, you know, Bleeding Gums is being nice, but he's not really trying to be involved in Lisa's life. He's just being like, ah, oh, this kid's there, and I'll, I'll humor the kid, and, you know, the kid's not really bothering me. And, you know, he's taking her seriously, but not way too seriously. Well, he legitimately compliments her, her musical ability. He, he thinks it's legit that she does play, indeed plays well, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the episode, he performs her song. 
you know, the, that she composed. Yeah, I mean, I, I ultimately, what the episode is doing there, yes, it's just Marge being a concerned parent, doesn't feel it's appropriate for her daughter to be hanging out with this older stranger. And as you said, she she handles it well. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't freak out, she doesn't scream at him, she doesn't say anything offensive to him, she just... Lisa, get away from that jazz man. Nothing personal, I just fear the unfamiliar. What I appreciate in this episode is that Homer, again, is, you know, this is in the era where he's not completely an idiot. He is trying the best he can. You know, he's not trying to undermine Lisa or, you know, he admits he's, you know, he's, he admits his shortcomings and, you know, he's, and he says that outright. I think it, again, it reminds you when you look at this early era of The Simpsons, again, going back to what I've always said about this, especially the first season about it being a live action sitcom versus more of a cartoon that I think that is a very, you know, human thing to say and very uh, aware of what he's trying, you know, what he can and can't do. This does show, showcase, again, a sensitive side of Homer where, you know, he's, he's trying to be a good dad. You know, he, as you said, he understands his limitations and he's trying, you know, he's, he's trying his best. He's not great at it, but he's trying. I will point out one other thing. is just that him remarking to Marge when Marge is talking about the sensitivity of Lisa. And, of course, I wouldn't have picked this up at, up at age six when I saw this. But, like, when Homer refers to, uh, you know, Lisa's problems and what Marge is talking about is some kind of underwear thing, it was like, oh, man, I didn't realize what he was trying to get at there. You know, again, you wouldn't pick – you. that is not something you would pick up as a, uh, as a young kid and what I think he's trying to infer about a uh, possible change of life uh, with Lisa. Yeah, I mean, that is that is something. Although Lisa, I believe, is nine. I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that's... I think she's oh, no. supposed to be... Uh, she's even... She's not even... She's always been eight, but that's... She only becomes eight in the Michael Jackson episode. So she's actually seven at this time. That's an interesting point. She's eight. She turns eight in the, in the Michael Jackson episode because it's, it's her birthday. But here's the thing. I, I don't know... Since we've discussed this, there's no real continuity to these episodes, no. really. It's very strange because Bart is 10. He's and perpetually he's, 10, yeah. He's perpetually 10, and he's in the fourth grade, perpetually. Yep. But there are episodes like there's the famous episode of, of Bart's birthday where I believe he turns 10 in that episode. You know? He does, um, and, uh, but he was – and they even announced you – they have the episode about his birth, and he was you know born in 1980. So, yeah, the continuity has always been – they, they've always been real arbitrary with the continuity. Oh, and I want to mention uh, one other thing that I thought was noteworthy with this episode. I think this was also one of the earliest episodes where we had Bart crank call Mo, And uh, this was one of the more lesser crank calls. Mo wasn't as creative with his threats yet that we will see in later episodes. Uh, jock strap. Hey, guys, I'm looking for a jock strap. <laughs> <laughs> When I get a hold of you, I am going to gut you like a fish and drink your blood. <laughs> okay, so what do we think of this episode? I, th- I think it's 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 definitely not a funny episode. It's not a bad episode. It's, again, one of those early episodes where we see uh, the genesis, for lack of a better term, of you know many of the character traits that we later see throughout the series. We don't necessarily, you know, in regards to Lisa, uh, this is Lisa's first episode. And this lays the foundation for her character. Uh, we continue to see in the season more traditional sitcom type roles for the rest of the family. And then early attempts at kind of building out the characters of the town. But uh, not, you know, and, and, and then the idea of like, we think that these, some of these people are going to be uh, endearing and we're going to see them again. And, not, and that doesn't necessarily turn out. Ultimately, like you said, the, the episode's main... Um focus main purpose is to flesh out lisa Mm -hmm. sort of this is her episode you know it's it's the sixth episode of the show but it's it's the first one that really kind of focuses on her to sort of develop there will be more but it's it's the first one that begins to develop her character to sort of differentiate her from bart and so the the qualities that set her aside and make her special her the the fact that she's very introspective the fact that Mm -hmm. she has the whole she has the whole teen angst thing, even though she's not a teen. She's not but... a teen, yeah. It, it, we see a lot, and again, everything that she's going through, we've seen in countless uh, movies and TV. I think it'll be interesting uh, to compare this episode to probably the next memorable Lisa episode, at least from, from what I can remember, which is Lisa's substitute, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, exactly. That's, again, fleshing out her character. And 
it's a as you said it's not a particularly funny one in in comparison with some of the it doesn't rely so much on humor it's more of a dramatic story of fleshing out lisa or dealing with her angst and we get a glimpse of her her talent her musical talent her sophistication you know because that's the thing about her too she's intellectual her her worldview and whatever else but yeah i mean i guess it's more of a it's more a significant episode than it is a particularly great episode it it is significant for some of the concepts that it introduces, for what it fleshes out. But as an episode, as a whole, it's maybe not. I mean, I certainly don't don't love it. I mean, I think that there are some funny funny bits, but it's not a great episode. Yeah, it, it's it's an episode you refer to to understand the series, but it's not in any ways funny. I mean, it's just, but it is memorable. I would say that's probably the best way of putting it. Thanks. I mean, this was a great talk. Definitely, we'll have you back uh, for the second season. You know, there's there's lots of good episodes coming. It's been a real pleasure having you here again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It's always a pleasure. So that's it for this week's installment of The Simpsons Countdown. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this, please give us a like. If you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment or two expressing your appreciation. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, a brief review would be much appreciated, but at least go ahead and give us a nice rating. Thanks. And if it isn't too much trouble, please do share this with all your friends, both virtual and actual, on your social media platform of choice. I'm Eric Santuan, and next time, I'll be joined once again by Petrus. He and I will grab a couple of beers and sit down to talk about The Call of the Simpsons, in which the family gets lost in the woods and go on to inspire a Burger King kids meal playset that probably costs a pretty fortune on eBay today. I hope you'll join us. In the meantime, stay safe.